Uh, well, I grew up in Tarrytown, New York, about 45 miles north of New York City. Uh, my father helped organize, was one of the primary organizers of the United Auto Workers Local at the plant, which is where everybody's father worked, including mine. Um, we lived under the hill, still called under the hill, in Tarrytown, New York. Uh, and when I was seven, they pulled me out of class because he had had a heart attack on the line, on the assembly line. And so my mother became a uh, working parent. Uh, she'd been a stay-at-home mom before that. And so she got me through to Swarthmore College. She got my sister through to Bennington. And so I go to Swarthmore, and my first year there, uh, I find out that there's an SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, chapter on campus. I had never heard of SDS before that. Uh, but I start going because um, I just want to see what I can get into. It's my freshman year. And I find that they are doing a lot of campaigns around um, uh, worker rights, uh, trying to organize the all-black, all-female cafeteria staff uh, for better working conditions, higher wages. I am part of that staff because I'm work-study, because I've got a four-year all-paid uh, scholarship, so that's work-study for that. And um, so I become part of that, and they're doing, uh, trying to desegregate public facilities in Chester, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Chester. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing they're doing is working with this uh, local movement in Cambridge, Maryland, on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, to desegregate facilities there. And so, um, again, I go to these meetings to find out what's going on. Um, I start getting arrested uh, when we um, do bus trips down to Cambridge, Maryland. And uh, that project, though, was um, a SNCC project because Gloria Richardson, one of the major leaders, local leaders of that Cambridge, Maryland movement, uh, she had asked for SNCC's help. And so they had sent one of the veteran SNCC uh, uh, organizers, uh, Reggie Robinson from Baltimore. And so um, I had decided, okay, I'll, uh, I'll take off my next semester, which would be the first semester of my sophomore year, okay. and just one semester, go down and uh, you know, work in Cambridge, Maryland for that semester. Uh, when I get there, um, we're doing demonstrations, and Reggie Robinson at some point says, look, I'm going to see to the wedding in Ohio of a, can of a, SNCC, a, a SNCC couple. And it was Bill Hansen, who was white, mm -hmm. and uh, Ruthie, 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 I can't remember Ruthie's name, from Southwest Georgia. And they were being married uh, in Ohio. So Reggie and I take this train to, to Ohio. I don't know either of these people. I, I, I become the matron of honor <laughs> for Ruthie. And then on the way back, uh, Reggie says, oh, why don't we just stop by you know, the national office on the way back to Cambridge, Maryland. And so uh, we do. And that's when I first see the national office. Okay, so um, I, I look at this, uh, first of all, I get to the, the office, right? And, um, and again, I'm thinking, I'm on my way back to Cambridge, Maryland. And uh, Reggie, the, the, the little office was on a side street, eight and a half Raymond. We had six and eight and a half Raymond. <laughs> and it was right near the um, uh, barber shop or beauty parlor, I can't remember which. And it was on the second floor. And so when you first looked at it, it I mean, we're talking a teeny tiny little street, as you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we look through this, this uh, window because it's, uh, you know, it's on the second, the SNCC office was on the second floor. And so you look through this window, which only showed stairs. And I see Reggie go, he opens the door, and he sees this guy who was at the top of the stairs and he's sweeping the, store, uh, the, the floor right, and the stairs. And I see Reggie go up, and I, he's hugging this man who has these overalls on. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, how egalitarian Snick must be, because this guy obviously is the custodian. Then I hear this custodian person say, hey, man, how you doing? No, excuse me. Hey, Captain, how you doing? And Reggie, and they're hugging like long-lost brothers, and I'm thinking, oh, this is wonderful, right? Turns out this guy in the overalls is Jim Foreman, the executive secretary of Snick. And so I come up, and Foreman finds out that I am at Swarthmore. So he assumes that I can write a literate sentence. He knows that I uh, also type 90 words a minute, because he asked me. And I also mentioned that um, I can do what is then known as Greg's shorthand, which I always say is like texting, but with symbols. And so he <laughs> says, no, you're not going back to Swarthmore. Come stay with me. You will be, with, you will be my secretary. And so I become the secretary. Reggie goes back to, to Cambridge, Maryland, 
and I stay there as, as foreman secretary in this teeny tiny little the SNCC office. And what it did for me is that I, I, it's like this bird's eye view of all of the expanse of the national office. So it's the various friends of SNCC all over the country. It's the main office in, um, in New York and the main fundraising office, but it's in Chicago. It's the friends of SNCC, it's the campus friends of SNCC. The print office is on the bottom floor. Um, it has the uh, photo department with Danny Lyon, um, mm -hmm. Tommy Wakiyama, all these things, research department with Jack Mendes, all of these things are part of this youth group, which I am coming to find out is really the only youth-led and also black-led, um, black leadership-led um, uh, civil rights, national civil rights organization. You know, I mean, this is um, unusual within the national, uh, national civil rights organizations. So particularly in terms of being um, uh, youth-led, I mean, because everybody was 19, 20, 21 years old, right? So um, when I come in, what I see is all of these people, and they're all busy. They all seem to be doing things. And I see Julian, and he is, a, I find out, director of, of communications, and he's typing, because Julian, as long as I knew him, could type <laughs> with two fingers faster than anybody I knew. I mean, I, when I say I type 90 words a minute, I mean, that's with all fingers, right? <laughs> Julian's doing this, right? And he's typing, and he always had the cigarette coming out of his mouth, and you know, the, the ashes falling down wherever they fell. Um, and always seemed intent, right? I mean, it was just always, you know. Um, and so I see him, I see Mary King, um, I see um, Bobby Yancey, who later becomes second in command at the Schomburg, um, library in New York, and she's head of um, uh, fundraising at that point. Uh, no, no, mm -mm. she was head of um, uh, black campuses, uh, recruitment on black campuses. Mary King? Uh, no, this is, I'm sorry, right. uh, Bobby Yancey, okay. who is second in command, right. later becomes second okay. in command at the Schomburg. And this is what year? Uh, this would have been, I come in in 1963, November, October. I land there in October 1963. So, um, and I'm trying to think, because uh, I come down to Cambridge, mm -mm. It probably, probably end of October, early November of 1963. So that's when I see Julian typing. I see Mary King also in the same office. Mm -hmm. I see Bobby Yancey. I see um, Dinky Romilly, who becomes second, um, uh, Foreman's second wife, but not then. So she's in the office, teeny tiny little office we have. And, um, you know, and I, I you know, I end up working in the national office. Busy, 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 busy. And, and didn't joke a lot at that point because I didn't know him that well. I didn't know that he had this rapier wit, which I later come to find out, but only after I get to know him. I mean, you have to understand, I'm, I'm coming from Tarrytown. I know nothing about anything, right? And so all of this is like so new to me. And so all the people I meet are like heroes to me. I mean, it's like they are changing the world as I know it. You know, and they're my age. A lot of them look like me, which I'd never seen in Tarrytown. And so this is like, I'm just in awe of everything. So um, I'm also in some ways um, a little afraid of everybody because they all know so much more than I do. And Julian, you know, when he would speak in meetings, people would listen to him, you know I mean? And, and because he was always so clear um, and it always seemed to come from such a foundation of experience and knowledge. And, you know, I come to find out, you know, he was head of the Atlanta movement, you know, along with others, but he was part of the leadership. So all of these young people like Julian are coming out of, um, campaigns in a way that I had no knowledge of, you know, I'm, I, I again, I'm coming from Tarrytown, New York, home of Washington Irving, Irving you know, so, um, I didn't really come to know Julian that well until later on. Okay. So all of this is new. I knew nothing about Julian. I barely knew about SNCC. Okay. The only thing I knew about SNCC was through Reggie Robinson because he was the field secretary in Cambridge, Maryland. Now I will say Julian stood out, but you know, he stood out. Among in, those who stood among out. Among those. Yeah because he stood out for me in the way that Foreman stood out, in the way that Ruby Dar stood out, in the way, you know, there were, he was part of this group of young people 
who were doing these amazing things. So I don't know that he stood out any more than Ruby Doris did, mm -hmm. who had done 30 days jail, no bail, and parts from prison. You know, I mean, there were, I was surrounded by this amazing group of people. Julian was one of those. Um, so I come to know him a little bit more when I'm working on his campaign. But at that point, mm -hmm. he's just part of this amazing band of brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in a circle of trust, you know. Was it intimidating? Oh, yeah, they were all intimidating. You know, Julie was intimidating, Foreman was intimidating, um, Ruby Inti Doris was intimidating, everybody was intimidating. Intimidating yeah. in the way that I knew nothing, okay. and I knew I knew nothing. And I'm now surrounded by these people who have been active in the student movement for three, mm -hmm. two, three, four years, right? And so, well, three years. And so what I'm seeing is people who are coming in and at staff meetings having opinions, not just about what's going on in their local movement, but also opinions about what's going on in Nicaragua mm -hmm. or Ghana mm -hmm. or these newly independent African nations. I'm hearing them know about the world in a way I never knew about. So I'm just sitting there, I'm taking notes, right? Because I'm foreman secretary, mm -hmm. and I take shorthand, mm -hmm. and I, I mean I have a, a piece in my uh, piece in hands on the freedom plan. I'm talking <laughs> about uh, still doing the minutes because I was so in awe of these people mm -hmm. that at my first staff meeting where they're bringing in the executive committee, I'm taking down what everybody, every single word everybody's saying, and I could do that because I knew shorthand, but also because I'm in total awe of these of these people. So I'm taking down what Ivan was saying and Charlie Cobb and. And, um, you know, Casey Hayden and, I mean, all these people, it's like, oh my God, they're brilliant, you know, and I know nothing. So that's what really does it for me. And Julian, among them, is, is, is part of that aura of what SNCC was, you know, he just, he's brilliant, you know. I knew that Julian, first of all, is just watching him work, mm -hmm. okay? So, I would see, hear Julian talking to these, you know, Claude sitting at the New York Times, you know. I mean, major people whom I come to know as major journalists, right, at like the paper of record, right? And he's talking to them on an equal basis because Julian knew so much and he retained so much. And he was so, you know, I hate to say it because black folks are, it's always, oh, he's so articulate. But he was, you know, he was amazing with that. And he had this base of, I mean, he had known Rosen, you know, I mean, so it's like, he could bring in all of this information and put it in a context so that it made the struggle that we were dealing with real. Mm -hmm. And he always spoke the truth. It wasn't only that he had absolute integrity, but he made sure that when he said, and Ju uh, Dottie Zellner, who worked with him before I get down there, and is still a close friend of mine, Dottie said, you know, when we said that there were 50 people at a mass meeting, there were 50 people at a mass meeting. So when Claude's sitting in the New York Times, here's Julian say, we had 50 people in the New York at a mass meeting. Claude Sitton knows this is the truth, because Julian's gonna tell me the truth. He's not gonna expand on it. He's not gonna you know, lie about it. He's not gonna do what the idiot in the White House is doing. He will tell me the truth. you know. And so when Claude Sitton is talking, um, Julian is also taking notes, because he always took notes on everything. Um, I learned about taking notes. When I'm working on Eyes on the Prize, I learned about that from the people who said, because you always took notes. You, so that you could always go back to your notes and say, no, no, you didn't say that here. Um, Julian also knew how to schmooze. <laughs> so Julian could sit in with, again, journalists, right, of any stripe. And he's talking and you could hear him, you could see him, you know, and he enjoyed people. He really had a love of people, including journalists. And so you could, you know, you would see him sometimes um, uh, at meetings, and he's talking to these folks, you know, and he's talking in a kind of camaraderie way, you know. He knows how to. Um, he just always met people on their own level, you know, and he could do that because he had such an openness and such a. Um, um, I mean, I would say warmth, but that seems touchy feely, and that Julian was never touchy feely, um, but there was a, there was a sense he had that he liked you. If he, if he liked you, that he showed that. And that, um, you know, he, um, yeah, I'll, st I'll stop with that. So the, the beauty that, um, no, the brilliance, the okay. brilliance of Julian is that he is able 
to talk about what SNCC is doing and make it real, but make it come out so that, um, articulate it in a way that regular people who do not know what we're dealing with will understand it. So when he talks about the fact that the FBI isn't doing the diddly squat to protect us, even mm -hmm. though it's federally mandated, when he talks about X mass meeting, mm -hmm. um, and he's talking about this to the press, um, and that could be local radio, um, it could be the print journalist, he's, he's um, interpreting it in a way that makes it real. He can storytell that, while at the same time being very, very factual. And so you can see it. The way Julian frames it, you can see this, this story happening in front of you. And so when he says, you know, something, you know, which allows people to understand, we are trying to register black voters without getting them killed. Mm -hmm. He makes that real through the storytelling. When he talks about Mrs. Hamer getting beaten in Wyona in 1963, in a jail cell in Wyona, Wyona Mississippi, with June Johnson, who was then 15 years old, with Anel Ponder, with others, he can make that real because he brings it forward without some, you know, um, uh, by storytelling it, by making these people real to the folks who were listening to him. He had a gift, you know, he had a gift of um, being so genuine and so principled, but saying it in a way that everybody could understand it. And he's doing that with journalists, but he's also doing that with regular people. So he's also talking maybe to the Friends of SNCC in Detroit. Um, now certainly the Friends of SNCC person who is doing, is doing that as well, but he's also, in addition to talking to journalists, He's also getting out the student voice, mm -hmm. and he's writing that with Mary King or, or, or Dottie Zellner. He's making sure that they're short, that they're not big, um, you know, unreadable um, reports of some of the things that are going on. He's working with the principal, with the, um, uh, the uh, camera, the, I'm sorry, with the photo department, so Danny Lyon or Tom, Tom, Tom Wakayama, um, all of those folks. He's coordinating all this so that what goes out is, is definitely SNCC's voice, and he makes sure it is SNCC's voice because he's the editor of the, of the, um, uh, you know, the student voice. Um, I mean, this is at a time when even the black press is not necessarily um, as much in the vanguard as we are. Uh, you know, I mean, the reason he starts, uh, he works with the Atlanta, um, oh, what was the, because the Daily World was the- The Atlanta Inquirer. Yes. So the, the Atlanta Daily World was the really right-wing um, Republican paper, right, black paper. Mm -hmm. um, but so he works on the Atlanta Inquirer um, while he's still in, the, um, you know, going to Morehouse because um, he knows that there has to be another voice that will represent what's really going on in the student movement. Well, he's able to talk to a lot of the black press in a way that they will understand. So the Atlanta, the Chicago, um, Chicago uh, Defender, um, the Baltimore Afro, um, the Pittsburgh Courier, all of those black press, uh, black newspapers that are getting the news out and not necessarily in the same, you know, we, are, we were progressives at that point, you know, it's not just that we're talking about um, uh, integrating facilities. We really are talking about structural changes within this white supremacist world, right? Mm -hmm. And so, although we don't call it white supremacy, we are talking about fundamental change in mm -hmm. this country. That's not necessarily what even the black press is talking about. But Julian is able to represent what we are doing and what our goals are in a way that the black press and the white press and the white TV folks will understand. He could interpret that in a way that they'll, they'll print it and they'll show it. Well, I'm not sure whether, um, see, he was among the elite, okay? So you could have had somebody who could only speak to the elite and was only comfortable around the elite. I mean, Paul Robeson was elite, okay? <laughs> um, even when you think about um, Kwame, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who later becomes head of Ghana, mm -hmm. right? And the first president of, you know, the, uh, the new independent state of Ghana, he was, a, you know, even Nkrumah was a favorite son, you know? Julian could have been somebody who could only speak to those kind of people. He was not. He could speak to everybody. So he could relate to somebody, he could relate to somebody who's a sharecropper mm -hmm. because he was comfortable with that. I don't know that being at Lincoln University where his, his father and mother are, 
you know, are part of the black elite. Mm -hmm. Whether that groomed him or whether his family and the sense that the family had that you will be easy with everybody, um, maybe that helped. Mm -hmm. But I, I, um, I'm not sure where he got that or whether he got it through the student movement, you know, because a lot of folks went to Morehouse who were not elite. And, um, you know, certainly the people he, he met in the student movement were not all elite. So, what, how, however he got that, he was very comfortable with everybody. And so when I mentioned that Kwame Nkrumah, um, who becomes the president of uh, the first president of uh, independent Ghana, that he knows him because Kwame Nkrumah has come through Lincoln, that's one of the things that you know you see in SNCC, and and certainly Julian is a part of that. That we in SNCC, as young, particularly the, this black-led SNCC, um, and uh, we're looking at this colonial struggle, anti-colonial struggle going on not just in Ghana, and, um, but also in South Africa, all of that. Well, one of the things that I realized when I come in, I knew nothing about this struggle, right? Julian and others are talking about it. And so when we take as our, uh, one of our, our kind of slogans, one man, one vote, we are picking up on the um, slogan that is used in West Africa, and particularly Ghana, uh, with their anti-colonial um, struggle there and they used one man, one vote. So we're, we're, when you see sometimes, um, some of the guys would carry little attache cases and you would see the bumper sticker, one man, one vote, that's coming from, from the African uh, anti-colonial struggle. Julian is a part of that. He's a part of interpreting that, of being aware of that from way back when, when he's at Lincoln University. I was in Atlanta from the time I get there, um, late October 63, I go down to, uh, well, we moved the entire SNCC office from Atlanta to Greenwood, Mississippi in mm -hmm. uh, the summer of 1964. And that's in Mis preparation for... Oh, I'm sorry, and, and so that's um, Mississippi Freedom Summer when we bring the 700 volunteers down to Mississippi. And I will say, I kept saying to Foreman, I want to go to the field, I want to go to the field, because that's where I thought the action was. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't want to be his secretary forever. And so um, when he's uh, probably at an anti-apartheid meeting in London, I think that was it, uh, Dinky Romilly gets me a ticket to go down to freedom, the freedom vote in Hattiesburg, um, Hattiesburg Mississippi in uh, 19, um, let's see, that would have been 1963, January 1963. And so I go down there. Um, so I'm in Mississippi that first time. Then I come back up again, I continue being foreman secretary. And when I say, by the way, that I'm foreman secretary, that also means um, I'm dealing with the pro bono lawyers in New York. Um, so Rabinowitz and Boudin and all the, I'm dealing with, um, oh yeah, I'm sorry, correction. Um, so the Hattiesburg Freedom Day is January 1964, yes. Um, and so I'm, I'm dealing with all those and, and you know, I'm good at this, you know. So, and actually Foreman found out I, well, they're good. okay, just strike that, okay. So Foreman wants to keep me as his secretary because I actually am good at this. I'm a good administrator. Uh, and so, yeah, I come back up after 19. So we move the whole national office of SNCC from Atlanta, although we keep a presence in Atlanta still because we, you know, we're in that building. But we move the office down to uh, Greenwood, Mississippi. Uh, 19, during the Freedom Summer, Mississippi Freedom Summer 1964, when those 700 primarily white volunteers come down uh, to Mississippi. And so I'm, I am based in the, in the SNCC office with Dottie Zellner, uh, and we're running the Watts line, which is the wide area telephone service, that's the 800 line, uh, where we contact all of the SNCC projects throughout Mississippi um, twice a day to make sure um, that people are still there, that they haven't been shot, to just check in. And then we do written Watts line reports. And um, so Julian um, was still in the national office much, much of that time in Atlanta. However, what I remember about Julian is his coming down with his brother, James Bond. Mm -hmm. And James had a small um, VW bus. Uh, I'm sorry, small VW bug. And a teeny tiny little bug, and, and so James would drive that. Now, parenthetically, James also taught me to drive stick shift on that because I was always afraid. I only knew how, to, I, 
you know, learned how to drive when I was 14, right? But I, I only knew automatic. And so I was always afraid that I would have to be, um, do a getaway um, in one of the SNCC cars, all of which were stick shift because they had been given to us by, uh, through the Black Caucus of the UAW. And so the Sojourner Motor Treat, uh, Fleet was our, there were 23, 24 cars, um, organized by Ruby Dar Smith Robinson. And uh, I was always afraid that I would have to drive it um, because maybe some Klansman or local sheriff was drive, you know, chasing us and I wouldn't know how to drive it. So Julian's brother, James Bond, taught me how to drive. I stripped Barry's gears on his VW. And um, so now it's 64. Julian and James are down and they are doing, um, making a tour of some of the SNCC projects because Julian's idea was that he would do actuality um, uh, audio. Mm -hmm. And so what he would do is he would, um, I should preface this by saying that the applications that the, these volunteers had to fill out uh, showed, um, it was maybe three or four pages. And one of the things that they said was, uh, uh, well, among the things they said, back up, so you'll edit this out, okay. On this application, they had to note not only whom to call in case of injury or death, but also what were the media outlets in their location. And so that was printer, print, print newspaper, you know, print, as well as TV and radio. And the whole point from Julian was that you had to make sure that um, the, the, one of the major points of doing this was fulfilled, which is that the folks up wherever they were outside of Mississippi would begin to care about all of these black people being killed because they were trying to register to vote. You had to make white America feel and care about this. Well, the way you do that is to connect them through their sons and daughters who are now in Mississippi. And so if anything happened to any of them, then we would then call their location, uh, say they were in Akron, Ohio, we would call the newspaper or, you know, Ipswich, wherever, Michigan, wherever it was, and you would say, um, John Jones has just been arrested in um, uh, Holly Springs, Mississippi and he's in jail and you know he lives at so-and-so in your town and so then we would do a report on the fact that john jones had just been killed, had, had just been put in jail julian you know was one of those the main people setting this up and so what he did though was when he and, Ju and and james came down to mississippi he would talk to some of these white volunteers and he would do four or five second stories with them and you would hear john jones's voice and he would then send this back to the radio station in John Jones's hometown. And they would then play it on their local radio. The voice of their hometown boy talking about how horrible it is being in Holly Springs and how somebody shot at them, how the FBI wasn't doing diddly squat, how, you know, uh, the local sheriff was really, you know, in cahoots with the FBI. All of this becomes real because it's coming through the eyes of their hometown boy or girl. And Julian sets this up, right? And he's, he's doing this, you know, with James, his brother, in this little VW bug, you know, going around Mississippi in the Delta. Um, so that, you know, that was Julian's brilliance. I mean, he was always thinking about how do you get this story out to the world that really done a bit more care. I don't think Julian ever thought at all about doing this, right? I don't think it was ever in his mind. What happens is that Ivanhoe Donaldson, who was this legendary SNCC field secretary, right, had just come out of Mississippi. We had just gone through um, 1964, um, not just Freedom Summer, but then um, being in Atlantic City, and I went up, Julian went up, you know. Mm. Now I'm trying to remember, did Julian go up to Mississippi, to Atlantic City? I do not remember. I remember all of us driving up from Mississippi, I don't remember. But in any event, um, Ivanhoe, Charlie Cobb, all of those folks, Ivanhoe, no, I'm sorry, see, now I'm backing up. Okay, let me back up because I was just with Charlie and I'm trying to think if he was actually, yes he was, of course he was. Okay, so, back up, okay. Um, so all of us had just been through um, not only Mississippi Freedom Summer and all of the violence and all of that, but then we go up to Atlantic City, and the traditional Democratic Party under Lyndon Johnson 
um, turns us back. You know, with Miss Ella Baker, we had a sophisticated lobbying effort. We knew, I mean, we had um, a ticket. We knew everybody who was on the credentials committee. We knew all of this, even as 19, 20, 21 year olds. We knew who to, whom to, um, to, to lobby with. We thought we had it, enough votes to get out of the credentials committee onto the floor of, the, of Atlantic City, the, the uh, um, Democratic Convention. And then, of course, all the cards fall out um, because Lyndon Johnson is afraid he's going to lose the Dix Dixiecrat vote. What it told all of us, the SNCC, was you cannot depend upon the good wishes of the liberal Democrats. You can't depend on them. You have to depend on the folks who are most at risk in their own communities. So it's on that, it, with that sense, that in 1965, when we're coming off the Selma to Montgomery march, I and Stokely and a lot of other folks go into Lowndes County and work with that local organization to form the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. Because you can't depend on folks who are not part of um, the oppression that we're experiencing. Okay, doesn't necessarily mean only black folks, but it does mean it has to be the people who are directly experiencing the oppression. So that's happening in 65. I am in Lowndes County when I get the call from, from um, uh, Ivanhoe Donaldson, come work with us. We're going to run Julian Bond for this single member district in Atlanta. So I come out of Lowndes County and I go back to Atlanta and we start working. Now, this is Ivanhoe, because Ivanhoe decides, okay, in the same way that you're doing the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, and in some ways the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, you can also possibly bring SNCC's principles and, or, and, and grassroots organizing philosophy to a major city. And that will be the single, single member district you run Julian, whom Atlanta knows. They know his family because, I mean, you know, Julian's a prince. I mean, he really was. He's the prince, right? He is from this amazing family. He is wonderful and brilliant and intelligent and well-spoken and all of that, and absolutely principled. So what Ivanhoe says is to, says to Julian and, and convinces him, you know, we can, we can, I'm sorry, we can win this. We can really win this. So then he brings Charlie and Charlie Cobb because they're, they, you know, they're running mates and stuff. And so the two of them become the, the, the uh, campaign directors. I become the office staff, having just come from Lowndes County, Alabama. Now, at the same time that Ivanhoe and Charlie are running Julian's campaign as the campaign managers, and it's really Ivanhoe, um, they are also running the, at the same time, there is another campaign going on that both Charlie and Ivanhoe are running. It is in Springfield, Massachusetts, because Charlie's, Charlie Cobb's father, Reverend Charles Cobb, a uni, uni, uh, United Church of Christ um, minister in Springfield, Massachusetts, is running for mayor of Springfield, Massachusetts. So Ivanhoe and Charlie are running back and forth driving back and forth between Springfield, Massachusetts and Atlanta. That's a lot of miles. You got it. And I assumed that um, Ivanhoe had told Ruby Doris that he was doing this. Okay. At some point, I get this call, and I'm sitting in the office of, of Julian Bond's campaign office, right? Again, I'm the only staff person. And it was on, um, on Hunter Street, mm -hmm. Now, it's near Pascal's, but it's near, oh, actually the more, oh gosh, what was his name? Frazier's. Frazier's Restaurant. Mm -hmm. Frazier was absolutely wonderful. Pascal, he wasn't really clear about our politics. Well, no, he was clear about our politics and did not agree with them. However, Frazier, honey, was wonderful. He would feed us. We would have our exec committee meetings in his basement. Um, it was wonderful. So, um, right Next door to Frazier is where I was. And so I remember getting this call from Ruby Dar Smith Robinson, who was the, you know, really, she ran the, she was the office manager, but that doesn't even say how outsized her function was in SNCC. And she says, 
she's looking for Ivanhoe, doesn't know where she where he is. So she calls me and I says, Oh, uh, yeah, he's up in, in New Haven in um, Springfield, Massachusetts. She says, What? No. Ruby did not suffer fools gladly, right? Ruby, she may have known that they were somehow involved in this campaign, but she definitely didn't know that that's where they were now at that point. The next call I get is from Ivanhoe, and he's yelling at me. I mean, Ivanhoe tended to yell. And so Ivanhoe is yelling at me, why did you tell her where I was, right? I said, I assumed Ruby Doris knew where you were. So then that's a whole other thing. But Ivanhoe and Charlie come back down again. I mean, SNCC certainly knew that, um, that SNCC was involved. This was a SNCC campaign. I mean, it was absolutely a SNCC campaign. Um, but it was not, it was not Julian's idea, it was Ivanhoe's idea, because he wanted to see, this was an experiment, which he later comes, you know, carries forth in a lot of other major cities. So he becomes the campaign manager for Marion Barry, mm -hmm. right, on that first campaign, and then a number of other things, you know. Um, he's working with uh, Mayor, Gary, um, Mayor Hatcher in Gary, Indiana. He's working with Dinkins in, later on in New York City. He's working with a lot of progressive, um, particularly black, um, black electoral officials, elected officials. Mm -hmm. But he begins that with Julian Bond's campaign. You know, I don't even know. By the time I get there, it's a feta complete, mm -hmm. you know. And so all I know is I'm running this office, I'm trying to make calls, I'm doing the, the calls about, you know, will you get out and register, are you registered? Or, my main memory of that though is um trying to get people to do events where they'll do house parties for julian mm -hmm. and i had gotten this one event and it was the red rosebud savings club and it was a woman who um uh 80 well they were kind of late 70s early 80s black women out gordon road in in atlanta in the west end in the west end of atlanta yep. and um so I had arranged for this to, you know, to go on. It was a Sunday. And I'm waiting for Julian to hit the office so that I can drive him to the West End, to the Red Rosebud Savings Club. And he's not coming. And he, I, he, I don't see him, and I'm worried. And at that point, I am somebody who is not used to speaking in front of any groups. But I'm thinking, I'm going to have to show myself and go by myself to speak to the Red Rosebud Savings Club. So I get in the car. And I'm driving down uh, uh, Hunter Street, now Martin Luther King Drive, um, and I'm heading, and just as I pass going one way toward the West End, I see Julian and his then wife coming the other way. And I, I stop on Hunter Street, I stop the car and I say, Julian, Julian, we got to go to the, the Rosemary Savings Club. And um, what had happened was, oh gosh, I'm blocking on her name, his, his first wife. Alice. 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 Mm -hmm. So Alice says, I see them negotiating. Finally, Julian gets out of the car. He gets into my car, and she drives away. And he says to me, he, get, he gets in my car, and he says, Julie, uh, he says, Alice finally got, you know, he, he, she's not happy because we were going to do the wash. And it was finally a point where he, you know, she, she could corral him to do the wash. So um, I said, but we got to be there. We're already late, right? Okay, so we go on. And he walks into this group of, I swear, it couldn't have been more than eight or 10, 79, 80-year-old black women. And you can tell they are so, they love him. You know, he walks in and they just immediately love him because they feel, they feel, he is like the best of them. He is this, this warm, wonderful young man who would be somebody they would be proud to call their son or son-in-law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, they see this in him. And so when he starts talking to them, um, they want to listen, you know, because he also had, you know, this wonderful voice. But what he says immediately, you know, he makes very clear is that he's there to listen to them. And that, yes, he has an agenda, which is um, 
you know, basically SNCC grassroots agenda. It is, uh, I want to, um, you know, we need more low income housing. Uh, we need better wages. Uh, we need, it's all of the particularly economic um, issues that, uh, because, you know, black people could vote in Atlanta. Um, so it's not, you know, getting registered, you know, it is, it, it's not the vote issue, it is the economic issue. And at this point, things are more or less, you know, um, integrated, but for this group of people, they're not interested in, you know, going downtown to eat. They don't have the money to go downtown to eat, you know. They're interested in, can I get a decent job at a decent wage, okay. So, and a lot of them are working in white people's homes, or had, and so, um, He's talking to them around the issues that they most care about. But then his main thing is, what do you care about? What do you want me to do when I get elected? And so he's doing a SNCC, a traditional SNCC, um, grassroots campaign, which is, tell me what you want me to do. You know, I am your servant. And you see these women absolutely open up um, and see in him a different kind of politician. And it was wonderful. I mean, you know, he gets energized, I get energized, because these women are just feeding him, you know, surrounding him with this sense of, um, you know, to say love is just too easy. Um, it is a sense of um, caring and a sense of trying to circle us with, we're going to try and protect you as much as we can. It's the kind of thing that you often saw when we were in the field, people who didn't have much but who had, who would give you whatever they had because they felt that you were, you were trying to do um, the best for them, that you were going to work with them and you were going to be with them in this struggle. That's what you got from these women. And it was just, it was, it was amazing. It was wonderful to see. Yeah. And when he runs for Well, the thing is, I had been, I mean, all of us in SNCC had been used to working with people who were three times our age. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Amzie Moore is the one who had been doing work, you know, in the Regional Council of Negro Leadership from the 1950s, you know. They're the ones who had always guided us. You know, it's C.C. Bryan, it's, you know, Mrs. Amelia Boynton, it's all of these older activists mm -hmm. who somehow see that even though you're 19, 20, 21 years old, we're going to trust you because it's clear that you are going to be here with us. You know, you're going to you're not gonna turn coat on us. You're not gonna, you know, go back to wherever you came from. And a lot of folks, of course, are from that community anyway. So we're used to being our age and having older people trust us because they could see something in us that said, these are folks who will stand with you and they're not gonna, you know, even if people shoot and beat them up, they're gonna be with us no matter what happens. And so it was not unusual to see these older women see the same thing in Julian that all, all these older people had always seen in SNCC people. Where did most of his support come from in the district he won? My sense was, and I, I'm trying to remember back now, but a lot of it was just regular people. It was not, um, it was not the uh, middle class, it was not the, the usual black middle class in, in, um, in Atlanta. They were going for whoever the person was who everybody thought was going to win, including me. I didn't think Julian was going to win, right? Uh, so it was, they were not usually our base. It was always the people who felt that they did not have a voice. The black middle class thought they had a voice in the usual black elected officials who were there, the ministers, the black businessmen and women. Um, that's not where the base of our vote came from. Well, I think, again, I, that had a lot to do with Ivanhoe, too. I okay. mean, you know, I mean, when, when you talk about what Julian decides about electoral politics, that's a lot of Ivanhoe. Um, uh, so it was because there was no way that you could move in, um, uh, in the Republican Party. It was, you know, that's where it was until, of course, you know, some of it turns with Daddy King, you mm -hmm. know, in the election in 63, so, um, uh, which we won't go into. The... Um, the main point was you couldn't run in, as a Republican because it was sewn up. Mm -hmm. That was sewn up by the black Republicans. Uh, so you had to, you know, and as a single member, this was a new district. And yeah, you could do that.
Julian was very much involved okay. in the chess strategy. I mean, Julian was his own man. I mean, you were not going to make Julian do anything he did not want to do. Um, and also, he was very bright, you know. I mean, and he had seen what Atlanta politics was like in a way that neither Ivanhoe nor Charlie did um, had. And so he's bringing his knowledge of having grown up in, in Atlanta all these years. Uh, he knew what he was up against. He knew what the, what the black middle class was like. He knew what this black, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, what black folks in power in Atlanta, um, what their, 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 their interaction with white folks in, in, in Atlanta and the kind of liaison that they had. I mean, black folks, when, when, when the slogan, you know, Atlanta is the city too, 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 uh, too busy to hate, when that came out, black folks parroted that as well. That was not just white moderates. Um, so black folks wanted things in a, in a lot of ways to say the way they did. Um, and that included the presidents of the colleges, as well as the black ministers, as well as the black uh, businessmen and women. Um, that's, and that's not what we espoused in SNCC, no matter where our campaign was, and certainly not within the campaign that Julian was running. Julian espoused, I mean, wherever Julian went, that's where SNCC went. And so Julian is bringing all of what he knows into this campaign. It's both the SNCC values, and that's grassroots organizing, it's structural, uh, you know, structural, structural reorganization, it's all of that. Economic redistribution, everything. He's espousing that as well. So it, it's kind of this combination of forces of people who know what SNCC want, it does and wants and what it believes, along with Julian's knowledge of what Atlanta is and what black Atlanta is. And he brings all of that into these campaign strategy meetings. So for someone who didn't think he was really going to win, he won over 80% of the vote. No, I'm not saying I, that Julian didn't believe. Oh, okay. I didn't believe. Oh, you didn't. Okay. Oh, no, no. I never believed that Julian <laughs> would win. I mean, for me, I said the same thing I did when Marion won. Uh -huh. And on the eve of the election, for both elections, I went up to Ivan and I said, I don't believe it. He won. You know, Julian <laughs> won. How is that possible? Um, but I said the same thing when Mary and Barry won. You know, um, Julian, people got Julian. You know, I mean, that was the thing. The electorate understood this is something different, you know. And, um, and I think they understood that Julian felt um, that, that Julian was running a different kind of campaign, that this was not the same old, same old. And they came out to vote with their family. I mean, that was the thing. Absolutely voted for him. It's amazing. Yeah, well, I first started working on Oz when there was the first incarnation of it, and that was in 1978. I become the first paid staff person, full-time staff person, and it has a different title. It's called um, America, We Loved You Madly, because uh, Henry Hampton, the head of Blackside, which produced all 14 hours of Oz, um, Henry had this uh, love the play on words, and um, America, We Loved You Madly was... Um, what um, Duke Ellington would say at the end of a jazz concert. He would come to the edge of the, staff, of the stage and he said, I, I love you madly, um, open his arms widely. So um, Henry loved the play on words of madly because he thought that was black folks relationship with this country. And so, uh, but I hated it. And so I, when we finally got staff together, uh, then I decide uh, that I'll send out this memo, which I still have. And I, okay, <laughs> so I have this, I still have this memo and it says it begins uh, two cap cities because cap city, capital cities communications was now funding it uh, by 78. And it said to cap cities folks, and it starts, uh, y'all know how much I hate the current working title. So below are the um, first, um, first phrases and the titles of freedom songs. There'll be a tie in musically, you know, there's no order of preference, da da da. So I start with, you know, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Then number six is keep your eyes on the prize. I go all the way down and there's number 27 or 28, has a little asterisk on it. And it says, um, as, a po as a proposed title, uh, we sang and prayed and they beat the shit out of us anyway. 
Okay, and the asterisk, and then the asterisk says, my, my personal favorite. Now, Henry obviously did not take that, but what I was told by Steve Fair, who was the series writer, was that up until broadcast, he was telling Henry, eyes on the prize, nobody will get it. That was the, ch that was the title Henry chose. Nobody will get it, you know. Um, so that didn't get, the funding r ran out for that for various reasons. So now we fast forward to 1984 and we're then picking it back up. I'm going back and forth um, between New York City and Boston. Okay. We start production and around 86, we really go into production at Blackside, owned by Henry Hampton on the south end of Boston. And Henry decides he wants Julian to be the narrator. And um, so Julian and I, you know, we're working together, but um, it's really the producers who are working with Julian doing the voiceover narration at the studio. Because at that point, I'm director of information for the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice in New York City. And um, so I'm going back and forth. But during one of the screenings, uh, what happens is that, because we have no money. I mean, Black Thought has no money, right? But it's doing this first six hours of the 14 hours. And... Uh, we're doing a screening and, and Henry always Henry Hampton head of Blackside always had this thing that you don't just have the producers in a screening you have um, the interns you have um, some of the local sponsors you know um, Ruth Batson head of the NAACP education I mean all the people he knew and it's at a community it's a, a Boston film and video right so the projector breaks down and the project we were shooting film on that first series and so the projector breaks down and Callie Crosley, who, um, and, and we were doing the Selma to Montgomery, the last, the six hour in that first six hour series, the uh, Selma to Montgomery March. And so it was Callie Crosley and Jim Devinney, the two equal co-producers. And um, it breaks down and Callie runs up to me in a rush and she says, sing a freedom song. Okay, now Julian is sitting next to me. And so I turned to Julian and I said, we got to sing a freedom song. Now, I don't sing. I mean, I'm on tune, and I have a really loud voice, but it's not a good voice, right? <laughs> and so I sing the, I say, we got to sing. Now, anybody who knows Julian knows he doesn't sing either. But we start singing. So we start singing, ain't gonna let no projector turn me round, turn me round. And Julian is singing. He does not care because what's wonderful about Julian is he does not care if he seems silly. You know, I mean, he's Julian, right? So we're singing and we get not only these producers who by this time know all these freedom songs, right? Because they've been working with this footage all this time, archival footage, working with interviewees who sing the freedom songs in their interviews. We also get these scholars, you know, who are like um, um, Charles, not Charles Payne, but um, oh, who did local movement, um, Local, local people, I'm now gonna forget his name, Not the one who precedes Charles Payne on local movement history. Oh, I'm forgetting his name, scholar. Um, John Dittmer, okay, so John Dittmer's in there. Just lots of folks who are doing, um, uh, who are our scholars, you know. Um, and, and so these scholars are not used to singing either. They're rather stiff, you know, and they're singing because there's a spirit now in this room and everybody's singing this freedom song, you know, and loudly, you know, and Julian singing loudly, you know, and it's just this wonderful moment where we all get into the same space. It becomes a different space because as it did for mass meetings, you know, the, the movement songs make it a different kind of space, you know, and everybody's, it's like people feel differently now, you know, I mean, it's like, we're back in the movement, you know? And so they look at the, the cut differently too. I mean, it's like, you know, this is a movement song. This is a movement cut. This is a movement movie, you know, all this changes. Um, and so it's just lovely, you know, it's just lovely. Um, so that was my experience with Julian on the cut. But I will say, um, everybody who worked with Julian, all the producers who work with Julian um, doing the voiceover narration at a studio, everybody had stories to tell about Julian. And everybody felt like he was their new best friend, you know. So I remember um, one of the, Paul Steckler, who did this, who was on the second series of Eyes on the Prize. 
And Paul mentioned how he went, he was talking to Julian, and I can't even remember the joke that Julian did. But there, Julian, you know, was still smoking at that point, so he had to take a smoke break, you know. And so he's going outside, and he says some funny story to Paul Steckler that Paul still remembered, but of course I have now forgotten. But everybody remembered how amazingly funny Julian was. You know, I mean, Julian could just crack you up. You know, he just, um, so anyway, that, that's the end of that story, yeah. I mean, Julian always was principled. You know, it didn't have anything to do with what pressure he was gonna come meet as a result he was principled and he took those principles into whatever arena he was operating in and maybe even not operating in you know so um in terms of gay rights he was one of the first black folks in any leadership position who came out in support of gay rights and that was lgbtq rights um and i remember being um julian and i had been uh with chuck mcdo the first chair of SNCC. Um, at a program that Cleveland Sellers um, had put together at um, South Carolina, I'm sorry, yeah, at University of South Carolina. And it was to honor the 25th anniversary of the University of South Carolina's African American Studies program. So Chuck and Julian and I were there, um, as was Bakari Sellers, you know, uh, Cleve's son. And so I'm now, we're, Julie and I had to leave to go get a plane. So I'm now in the airport at, at the South Carolina Columbia Airport. And I say to Julian, um, you know, I asked him, how did you manage to go against all that black leadership and come out in support, such vocal support of gay rights? And he starts talking about, you know, these retrograde black ministers and, um, you know, uh, black leadership that really did not see, you know, and nobody's saying that gay rights is the same thing as the black freedom struggle. Not saying that, but it is a struggle and it is a campaign that you've got to support. And so he talks about that and he, he talks about the slam back, you know, the pushback that he gets from, um, from some leadership that he just expected. Um, he expected it from a lot of folks, but there's some that he didn't expect it from. Um, but no matter what happened, he was gonna make, he was gonna hold strong. And then he starts talking about how one of the, the, um, one of the strategies he used was that he would quote the Bible. Now this was very funny because, you know, Julian was an atheist. And so um, he would quote pieces, you know, um, uh, phrases from the, you know, call it phrases, um, tell him how churched I am. Um, <laughs> he, he would quote, um, oh, my mother would smite me, I swear. Um, Cause she read the Bible five times um, over. Okay, uh, what do you call it? From the Bible, it's biblical verses. Okay, so he would go to, you know, so-and-so uh, -and, -so and, and talk about this, this particular verse that said, well, if you are, you know, menstruating and you are a woman, you, you have to use certain kinds of cloth and you can't come out. And so then he would say to these black ministers, well, so are you saying that this is true still too? So if you're gonna go back to what the Bible says about this particular thing and gay rights, are you going to then hold strong about, you know, ham and so and so and so all the, the horrible things that are in the first in the Old Testament? So um, he knew what to use in what in what arena to, to prove his point. And he was just so read about everything, even the Bible, you know, he just knew it. Um, and he always held strong. So when I was um, a visiting professor at Brown University and uh, and that was uh, from, I was, I started 19, I'm sorry, uh, 2012 through 2014. And um, I'm trying to think, or 2011 through 20, anyway, figure 12, 12 somewhere around there. Somewhere around there. Close enough. Close enough. And I uh, had just talked about Julian, uh, you know, as just one of these, one of, one of the amazing people in SNCC. And this young guy came up to me, young white guy comes up to me, student, after class, and he says, and he's just really excited, and he says, Julian Bond is one of my heroes. He said, you know, I'm in, and it was, you know, one of the gay rights um, uh, student organizations, and he said, you know, and I saw what he was doing and how amazing it was, and he said, you know, 
um, he, he, he just, I'm, I'm so, um, it just made me feel good, you know, that somebody from the, from the civil rights movement, from the traditional civil rights movement, would feel that they would, could support the movement that we're doing now. And so, um, you know, I said, well, Jul you know, that's Julian. You know, Julian is not gonna shy away from anything, no matter how difficult it was. Um, and so, you know, he, but it spoke to him and that somebody from the traditional movement should be doing this was, you know, was really important to him, yeah. And it didn't surprise you in the least? Oh, not, not at all. You know, that was Julian. Um, I mean, there was, there were, it's not only that within um, the larger society in the world, you know, there is a homophobia um, that can be lethal, um, but Literally. certainly, I'm sorry? Literally. Literally, yes. Um, but also that within, um, you know, with, even within the black, um, black freedom struggle and within the civil rights movement, um, you would have homophobia, right? And certainly you get that among some retrograde, you know, the, the less progressive um, black ministers. Um, but, and, and you would find that even within some SNCC people, you know, that's, that's not unheard of either. But I would never um, have assumed otherwise for Julian. I mean, just because that's Julian. Julian is always principled. He always sees commonality of struggle. Um, and he's never going to back down. And he will tell you what he thinks. Yeah. Yes. What I'd like to leave with is um, something that I said. I, w I was one of the two SNCC folk who... Um, who spoke at uh, Julian's memorial, and it was a wonderful memorial. And Tim Jenkins was the other person from SNCC. But when I spoke, um, I had, um, I, I ended with something that Julian said um, to a reporter, no, actually to a, um, I'm trying to think, let me, let me just get back to what he did. Oh, he, let, me, let me say it, like yes, uh, let, me, let me read this, please. yeah. Um, I said, to, to end, we and SNCC bonded, as 18, 19, 20-year-olds often do, except that our bond was forged in struggle and was stronger because racists at every level were trying to kill us. We really were a band of brothers and sisters and a circle of trust, and that bond exists, um, exists even today. So Julian reflected on that lasting bond last year during the 50th anniversary conference for Mississippi Freedom Summer in Jackson, Mississippi. He told radio interviewer Eric Mand what we, his SNCC comrades, meant to him. So this is a direct quote from Julian. He said, to see old friends, to see old buddies, to see these people with whom I went through the most important years of my life just means so much to me. I am so happy to be here, he says, speaking of the SNCC conference in 2010, and at Shaw University, which is where the first conference went. So he says, I don't want it to end. I'm going to miss it. And I know that some of these people I'll never see again. And so I would say at the end of that, presente Julian. And that, that was Julian's word. Thank you. Thank you.